Question? Yes, I will indeed. Because I don't know. <laughs> I just don't know the know. answers until you know the questions. Huh? I don't want to know what you want to know. Well, uh, CB, or perhaps I should say uh, a Dean Emeritus, uh, Carol B. Nablet of our College of Graphic Arts and Photography, uh, what I'm starting is an oral history of RIT, and this afternoon I'd like to chat with you a little bit about some of your recollections and your reminiscences of the early days, because you were one of the early men in the Ellingson era, and I know you have some very interesting anecdotes and some recollections. Uh, so in just a moment now, uh, we'll double check to see if this is recording all right, and if so, then we'll go right ahead. Well, C.B., uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about when you came to the Institute and uh, how you happened to come to the Institute. Uh, I've always been a little bit uh, hazy about that. Well, the first thing, of course, is that the, uh, to go back a bit, the uh, Department of Photographic Technology was organized uh, in 1930 uh, by uh, Earl Billings, who was director of training the personnel for uh, Kodak, and he was joined in the support of it by uh, Bosch and Lohm and uh, Haloid, now Xerox, Defender, now DuPont, and uh, they set up a two-year cooperative course in photographic te technology to train uh, really apprentices for the uh, various companies. And uh, Mark was made uh, supervisor of the course, and uh, Rick Brem taught photography in the first year. And then I was acquired in the summer of 31, and was assigned by the company to take the uh, second year group in uh, September 31. You two were the entire faculty at that time, then, were you? Well, no, we weren't the entire faculty, but it's interesting that there was not a single full-time faculty member in the whole department, because even from uh, Mark divided his time in uh, curriculum uh, planning, development, and supervisor. Uh, Fred Brem and I were on a part-time basis from Kodak, uh, we came over as I remember each about uh, two half days a week. All the other faculty members were in uh, mechanical or electrical or other departments. But you were the only photographic people. Really. We were the only two, yes. Mm -hmm. Although some of the others uh, uh, dabbled in photography sometimes and mixed things up for us. That I can believe. Well then you, uh, you came full time in what year then? I didn't come uh, to the Institute full-time until uh, August 31. Um, I'm wrong, 36. And who all had joined the faculty by that time, the photo photographic faculty? Oh, I can't recall of any. I think Fred Brem and I were still carrying a load in clarity. In 36? In 36, yes. The first edition that I remember to photography uh, was in 37 when uh, Charlie Savage joined us. And then right after that, I'm not so sure about the years, but right after that was uh, Wallace Dobbs, of course, mm -hmm. who, both of whom are still there in the UK. Yes, that's right. And then Howard Colton came in 1939 because that's the same year. Yes, Howard came and uh, stayed with us for about three years, as I remember, before joining uh, Kodak. Yeah. Uh, well, now, you say this started out as a two-year cooperative course? Mm -hmm. uh, then that was changed before too many years, was it not, to a full-time? Yeah, the program. first, uh, I guess the first change uh, that uh, was different, the institute that I made was uh, the date I'm not certain of, when uh, we became a, co a full-time uh, course in the first year, followed by two years cooperative work. Now, what had happened was that the uh, 
we run into difficulties in getting our people into suitable employment at Kodak and elsewhere, but principally at Kodak because they were the major employers. Uh, and it seemed that the proper, or the best thing to do was to uh, give these people some preparation, some background in the field of photography before we sent them out on employment. And so I talked Mark into letting us change the course and make it uh, full-time the first year and cooperate after that. And I don't remember whether simultaneously with the uh, change to a full-time first year, we went to two years of cooperative work or whether that came a step later. But at any rate, that was the next uh, major development. And then, not too long after that, you gave up cooperative work as part of the curriculum. Then, in the in the war period, in the war period, we had a very small enrollment, an enrollment chiefly of women, and um, the logical thing in that war period seemed to be to uh, bring it back from a three-year course to a two-year full-time course, and that was done because there are only about 12 people in, uh, in the department, the students, I mean, uh, at the depth of the war. Yes. Uh, how many students had you uh, been accepting before that? Was it around 24 or no, 60 uh, or more than that? I'm a little bit hazy about numbers, but uh, I can remember one year we accepted 48, and I think that was before the war. I remember uh, asking Mark to come in to speak to them in the old uh, uh, Eastman Assembly Hall, and uh, afterwards checking with him, he said, you've got a whale of a lot of people there in the freshman class. <laughs> For those days, that was the 48 was a large number. In light of numbers these days, it does sound a little odd. Well, now, you were located uh, physically in the old shop building, were you not, the Eastman Annex? Well, if you want to discuss facilities, I can do that very connectedly and uh, concisely. Uh, we began in uh, two classrooms in the uh, first floor of the Eastman building. The numbers I don't remember, but they were on the north side. Uh, one of them was a combination classroom and studio and one of the other classrooms had been divided into about five dark rooms, a uh, chemical solution mixing room, and a printing room. And that was the entire department in uh, 1931 when I came. Seems to me that about a year after that, I uh, talked to uh, Mark and the uh, pressuring uh, Dr. Randall to give us the uh, one of the classrooms up on the second floor to the uh, left of the entrance as you enter. Again, I don't remember the numbers. And we use that as a studio, so if you can imagine the, the uh, matter of having a studio up there on the second floor and having our labs down in the old area on the first floor. Uh, then sometime later, uh, they wanted that room as a classroom, and so we exchanged that for, I think, room 110. That was the big classroom directly on the end of the Eastman building next to Broad Street. E120? Oh, the one in the corner? Yes. I think that's what one it is. And uh, so we had a studio in there, which was uh, larger and uh, closer, of course, to the lab. It had its drawbacks, however. I could remember that uh, when anyone was making a uh, photograph, making an actual exposure, we had to stop everybody in the room and make them wait because the floor showed. <laughs> <laughs> then the, uh, the next move, which uh, may have been just before you came, uh, was to move to the annex, what we later call the annex, and we took over the uh, two floors at the north end, and we built uh, about 20, 24, I think, dark rooms in the uh, second floor, and we converted the upper floor into a studio. 
Yes, that had been done when I arrived in 39. Yeah. And then the next step from that was to supplement that space with the, uh, an old residence facing on Washington Street that had been used by the home economics people previously and was termed a practice house. We fitted that up in the studios and dark rooms for the uh, uh, senior students. And of course, the next step after that was the building of the Clark building, which was occupied in 46. Uh, I believe that's right, right after it the began, war. Yeah. It began construction on it uh, right after the war and was finished uh, about October sometime, 46. Uh, and you occupied the entire third floor of the Clark building. Uh, to go back a bit in the curriculum, you uh, call this the Department of Photographic Technology when we first started this afternoon. Now, uh, that was the official title. That was the official title. Uh, was the curriculum in photographic technology the only one offered at the beginning? Oh, yes. Uh, and then when did the illustrative uh, come in and the professional? Well, uh, there's an interesting story there. Um, we soon reached the plant, I say soon, by Oh, by the time I uh, came over uh, full time in uh, 36, we reached the point that the number of applicants and the number of people we were accepting uh, was a little greater than Kodak was prepared to accept on you know, cooperative employment. And furthermore, we were faced with a situation that there were applicants who did not want cooperative employment at all. And the uh, drift of those applicants, the reason they didn't seek cooperative employment was that they had no intention of following employment for the company. They wanted to go into professional photography. And so the uh, curriculum gradually shifted a bit uh, towards the professional field which created uh, quite a problem for me because of the uh, company at that particular time uh, did not want to be engaged in uh, training uh, professional photographers at all. And I was questioned over at the uh, company offices more than once on uh, about whether we were training professional photographers. And I had to hedge the question. But no doubt some would go out from the training that they were getting and become professional photographers, but we couldn't help that. We were still basically training in photographic technology. Then you sort of slid into the professional photography and the illustrative curriculum a little later than I remember. Yes, we went into the uh, professional photography first, and uh, although there was never a division at that time, I can't tell you when the actual divisions into separate curricula began. You'll have to get that either from catalog Catalogs, all from the uh, annual reports which if they've been kept in the move to the new campus uh, those annual reports would be a uh, place to yeah. get a good deal of information that isn't of course in the catalog I believe that was in the mid 50s but again I'd uh, uh, have to look at the I catalogs would, I would think so uh, of course we made the, uh, the administratively we made the change and uh, by uh, first by elective curricula, and it was quite a while before we completely separated them into uh, different departments mm -hmm. and all. Yeah. We had an illustrative major and a professional major and a technical major as I remember. But uh, the first year was the same, was it? The not? first year was the same uh, for quite a while. Yes, and they got their majors by electing in yes. the last uh, couple of years. Uh, now. You had some other very interesting uh, faculty members join your staff. Some of them left, some of them stayed. Uh, as I remember, you had a chap by the name of Shawcross at one time. Yeah, Percy Shawcross, who uh, had had a long career as an uh, advertising photographer in New York. He joined us and stayed until he was uh, 65 and did not care to stay on a, a part-time basis. He was followed by uh, Bob Bagby, and uh, Bob stayed, of course, until a year ago. Yeah. 
And Bob, of course, was a specialist in advertising photography. And well, they both were. were. They both were identically the same. And <coughs> you see, back in the very early, late 50s and uh, late uh, 40s and early 50s, uh, advertising with, uh, photography was one of the um, more attractive fields in professional photography. Uh, it has since changed somewhat, but at that time, and so we uh, were pointing, let's say, our more uh, energetic uh, people, high initiative in the portrait field towards advertising photography. And so that was why we tried to keep one man on our faculty uh, who had had uh, professional experience in advertising photography. Now, as the uh, years went by, and in 1950, as I remember, the Institute started to grant the associate degree, mm -hmm. and then along about 1955, the baccalaureate degree. That also changed the nature of your curriculums and the nature of the Yes. Uh, after the war, you see, we'd gone back to a two-year full-time course, or rather during the war, we'd gone back to a two-year full-time course, and we never changed. And so that meant that when... Uh, we went to the associate degree, we were set with a two-year full-time course. And then uh, when we uh, moved to the uh, bachelor's degree, we had the problem of adding on uh, two years more work onto the initial two. And uh, while there are a lot of complications and difficulties of fitting the parts of the puzzle together, it was uh, probably a little simpler for us than it was for some other departments. But you know all about that. Uh, well, again, you uh, you had a tremendous increase in the number of students, as I remember it, following World War II. Yes, uh, we had, uh, as a great many other people did, from the uh, returning veterans on the GI Bill. We had up to five or six hundred uh, applicants a year for several of those years. And you'd accept, uh, for a while, as I remember, you accepted 120, something like that. Something like that, yeah. Uh, what are the names of some of the students that went on and uh, really made their place in the photographic world? Even from the, from the two-year programs that we had in the, before the war. Well, a number of those actually, uh, oddly enough, have gone as far as anyone else. Uh, it would take a little time to think about these uh, in detail. I'll leave out some people, I'm sure, who uh, went on to uh, become prominent in their fields, but uh, Loomis Dean, for instance, uh, became a staff member of LIFE very early in LIFE's career and did a lot of work for them. And uh, in the class of uh, 19 and... Uh, 39 or 40, not sure which. We had two fellows in that same class, uh, Don Ross, who became uh, a chief of research and development for the Royal Canadian Air Force, and we had uh, uh, stop with the first name. Uh, Leroy Williams, uh, who uh, became chief of research and development in uh, photographic intelligence for the U.S. Air Force. Well, then there was another... Yeah. And there are many more. Gee, yeah. I could sit down an hour's time and give you a list <coughs> of 25 to 30. Uh, I used to say before I retired that you name any field of uh, photography of any importance, and I can tell you that we have somebody who's an outstanding in person field. in that yes. field. Well, there are two or three uh, uh, individuals, I can't call their names, maybe you can. There was one chap who was in charge of uh, photography at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, was it not? Yes, he's now, of course, uh, uh, out professorship at Princeton, and that's uh, Pete Monell. Pete Monell. That's right. Also the head of the photographic uh, uh, section of the uh, National uh, Space 
administration in uh, Houston is uh, one of our people, one that we thought more, less likely to succeed. <laughs> that sometimes happens. I don't remember him. Well, then there was yes, he is. He was a Canadian boy, the uh, poorest one of all the Canadian RCA men we had. <laughs> uh, Jerry Yulesman is another name that occurs to me. Uh, didn't he make quite a name for himself? Uh, he has, yes. I think he's in Florida at the moment. I don't know if it's the University. I think it's the University of Florida. Yeah. Well, there's been a great uh, list of people that have gone out. Uh, now, when did some of the later majors ca come in? There have been additional majors in addition to the, the technical, the professional, and the illustrious. Well, of course, before the others came in, the, uh, the master's program was begun mm -hmm. in science. And there's now one in illustrative. Well, there's one in illustrative, I guess, before I left, yeah. And uh, the new ones have been the uh, medical, which is now a four-year program. The biomedical. Program. Yeah. And uh, one in motion picture now. Yes. Which came in. Well, you see, we started that, but not on the basis of a separate four-year curriculum. No. And uh, the uh, the other is the. Uh, what, are, what are originated, what we originally talked about, was a uh, major in the photo finishing field. What they finally termed it, I don't remember. In fact, we had a different title for it, which I don't remember now. I think it is a major in photo finishing, and of course the, the MPDFA, the Master Photo Dealers Association, uh, assisted greatly in setting yeah. up an endowed yeah. profession. Well, we work, I worked with them uh, uh, originally. And then Charlie and I worked with them uh, for about oh, 10 years before yeah. that happened. Uh, you're mentioning Charlie. I think we've left out a couple other faculty who were our own graduates that uh, certainly played an important part. And Charlie Savage was one of them. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, Bill Shoemaker, yeah. who uh, went through and is now director of the School of Photography. Uh, now, there are certain administrative changes that took place during your years there at the Institute. Uh, when the Institute went from all of the department heads reporting to the president to arranging some of them in uh, divisions, you became division chairman and held the dual position of division chairman and also department head for a while. And, uh, well, that was in your time. Yes, yeah, the, yeah. the School of Photography and the School of Printing mm -hmm. were brought together in that division. I don't, don't even remember whether that... Well, you know, check that on the catalog. That came in the early 1950s. I don't, I, there are some details there that I don't remember. What I remember, uh, a couple of things that you might not pick up from anyone else except Mark, is that uh, in the early days, two things I might comment on that uh, for a long time the policy committee, which was composed of all department heads, uh, under Charter's direction, uh, nearly all of its meetings, a, a good part of each meeting, was uh, devoted to the review of a policy book of policies and procedures. And I was trying to think this morning uh, who it was who did most of the work on that. Now, I can see his face, but I can't remember his name. George Barton. Barton, Bart, 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 yes. The other thing that was interesting uh, was, of course, that Charters had us all busy when I arrived there. And uh, the analysis, of course, is, or in the uh, preparation of um, now, do the analyses of all the operations and all the fields that we are teaching. And, uh, of course, Mark knew very little about the field of photography from that standpoint. And so uh, I used to take off usually Saturday morning when there were no classes and all. And Kodak let me off because I was still on a part-time basis in those days come over and uh, he and I would work Saturday morning on the 
do the analysis of what the person does. And uh, I always uh, was uh, did this under uh, well because it had to be done. Uh, I never was in favor of it because uh, I said this an education based on this is not enough. It doesn't look ahead and it doesn't look at uh, what is involved in these operations. And I said this is nothing but mechanical training like I had back in, in grade school years and years ago. But he said well uh, this is what we're doing so let's get on with it and do it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I remember there was some of that attitude when I came to the Institute Charters. Of course, uh, came as a consultant uh, five times a year, two days at a time. And, well, he came every month at first. Well, that's right. I guess that was when I first the, started. This was a 30-day assignment from one visit <laughs> to the next. Well, uh, fortunately, by the time I arrived, he was only coming uh, every other month. Yeah, and Tyler was coming then. Yes. Tyler came twice a year, as I remember. And uh, these opinions have stuck with me, and that is that Tyler's visits, although I had nothing much importance in connection with them, I always somewhat looked forward to them. And I continued that attitude towards his visits to the day I left. Mm -hmm. But Charters, I felt, got less and less, and, uh, became less and less important to us. Well, that was one of the early experience of the Institute and uh, Dr. Charters is a fine old gentleman uh, but uh, I think that the activity analysis as he practiced it uh, did uh, outlive its usefulness. It was uh, it was strictly a vocational school technique and it's useful in determining whether you're uh, leaving anything out but it's not enough. Of course we had some other old problems those days and maybe not to even Mark would tell you uh, Colonel Randall was a person of strong ideas. Uh, he had the idea, of course, that there shouldn't be any separate courses in math. Math should be taught where it was to be used. Yes. And, of course, Herman Martin didn't agree, and he dropped the brunt of the argument worse than I did. But uh, I usually got the backfire of it. And we taught math, and we taught it as a separate subject. <laughs> I think maybe what we should do is to turn this over now. We're just about at the end of the okay. one side. And rather than uh, cut it off in the middle of a sentence, I think I'll just turn it over. Well, I hope I haven't... Uh, well, this is great. This is the sort of thing, CB, that I really was looking for. And, uh, and uh, so you called me down about it, and I said, well, I'm having to. And I said, we just don't have the space and equipment. I mean, do anything else. Yes. I remember that uh, President Randall was very much against the lecture, and uh, in fact, it was a supervised, individualized. You're not going to use this focus, but you want it. Because some of these things you may not even know. You're on? Come on, you want to talk? <laughs> okay. Uh, I can turn. We were talking about uh, some of Colonel Randall's ideas. I don't mean to uh, speak in the uh, depreciative value of them, but uh, I think I mentioned the fact that he didn't uh, approve of math as a separate course. He also thought that the uh, a year's work in a given subject should be a number of uh, assignments or projects. You should take the whole year break the work up into a number of assignments. And when the uh, student had completed those assignments, he had completed the year's work. And in those days, on a cooperative basis, why we usually had some full-time students who didn't get cooperative employment, they might theoretically finish up in March, or even late February. And those who uh, were on cooperative employment normally would be expected to finish up in May or June, depending on their cooperative period. And so 
we were instructed to make a chart and keep it in our offices where any student could see it. And this chart had the number of numbers of the projects at the top, uh, the students down the left-hand side, and then we were put into each uh, square uh, the date the project was completed, and then uh, the grade. And so uh, that uh, any student could walk in uh, to the room and uh, look at the chart and see what projects he'd been credited with and uh, what the grade was, uh, which all looks very neat and orderly. Uh, now all the instruction, theoretically, was to be with that individual at work on the project. Well, I don't know how it worked out in mechanical and electrical fields and all in those days, but uh, it, it didn't work out for me, or at least I didn't think it would work out properly. And uh, so what we tried to do was to schedule the projects on a certain time basis, and then at the at the time in which project number five, for example, was to begin, we'd get everybody together and we'd give them the background on project five. And if some of them weren't ready to follow on with it immediately, why uh, uh, they were supposed to take their notes and uh, refer to those notes when they were ready to begin project five. And so that's the way it went. Um, and I know that uh, instructors and, and uh, mechanical and along with uh, uh, Herman Martin's approval, did much the same thing. Uh, they tried, at least, to get that people together for uh, informal lectures at times. Well, uh, it's interesting that the more things change, the more they seem to be the same. Uh, I'm sure that you remember the, the uh, lack of grades that the Institute gave in the mid-30s. The anecdotal behavior general, which was uh, started, and I guess probably carried yeah. out. Yeah, statement grade. Statement grade. Statement grade carried on for a year or so, and it's inter that was interesting. I I thought that was not a bad idea, uh, but of course, uh, in about a year, you and Prime was that uh, well. Uh, these grades don't translate for other institutions who transfer and. Uh, Students aren't very happy with them. They don't know whether this this statement grade really puts them up here in the A level or down in the C level of where it is. So then we uh, changed to a letter grade and the statement, which we said explains the letter grade. And the inevitable thing, of course, after two or three more years, why the uh, statement dropped statement out. Statement grade dropped out. But now, of course, with the turn of the wheel again, and this was truer probably two or three years ago or two years ago than it is now, students didn't want to be graded, or they wanted just to pass and a fail grade. Yes, I know. And there was a great swing to that again. Uh, now I think the swing is uh, is coming back from that towards the well. Uh, this uh, this pass and fail is somewhat like the. Uh, emphasis on black studies and open enrollment and some of these other things, uh, you're going to find that uh, the people who have been arguing for black studies, or at least the, the actual students, are going to realize that there's no vocational or occupational outlet for black studies. And they're going to realize that uh, this is the worst thing that ever happened to them. But these things seem to have to run their course in educational life. Yeah, yeah. But uh, those of us that look back on these things, it's always amusing to conjure as to why they really happen that way. Um, maybe I'll stop this for a moment. Uh, CB, as the uh, School of Photography matured, uh, certainly the reputation of it uh, grew by leaps and bounds, not only nationally, but actually internationally. Uh, to what do you attribute this? Uh, unusual growth, of both in magnitude and also in uh, the speed with which it grew. You worked closely with faculty and students. Do you want to just relate some of the things that you did there? 
Well, I think the reason for the growth was in the first place that there was a need and that um, no other educational institution had seriously uh, tried to do what we were doing and uh, hoped to do. Uh, Syracuse years before we started had made an effort in two year course and had given it up. And about the time that we started, uh, Houston initiated the course and they went ahead of us for a while. But when we were uh, still having only a two year course, they were given the bachelor's degree. And then uh, the change in uh, presidency and change of administrative viewpoint, they uh, closed out the department. And uh, there have been some other cases. Uh, Oklahoma Baptist had a course for a year or two, giving a, giving a bachelor's degree in professional photography. But we had a pretty clear-cut idea of what we wanted to do, and uh, which was always a uh, degree-grant institution. And uh, in the field, and we assembled a faculty that uh, had the same viewpoint and worked towards the same end. And we all worked together as a unit. Uh, every faculty member had his chance to talk in faculty meetings and uh, was listened to, and uh, we put our heads together and. Uh, the, the, the department was the department faculty. Well, I know that you had marvelous rapport, not only with your faculty, but also with your students. Well, we listened to students. Uh, and uh, long before we had a, a, fac a student faculty representative, we listened to students. And uh, when a student had an idea, I took it in the faculty meeting. If it was necessary to do it. And uh, good many ideas that were put in practice uh, grew out of conversations with students. Then you are. I think that I think that is absolutely necessary. Well, sometime along very early in the in my experience at the institute, you also initiated the idea of a student representative that sat in on all of that. That was in uh, in the days when uh, we were uh, not exactly inundated, but we had a lot of uh, uh, GI students. I think it's about 48 that started. And it again was an outgoing effort, continuing the effort to give students a, a, a perfectly evident method of contacting the administration and contacting the faculty. Now these students were elected by the other students were they not? They were not appointed by the administration. They were never appointed. They were always elected. When we started, we assured the students that uh, we would not veto anyone they selected, whoever they elected, we would accept. That he would be a full participant in fact the meetings. Uh, that we would have the right to go into executive session. Uh, Particularly sensitive subject, uh, but otherwise uh, he would sit in on all faculty meetings. As a matter of fact, we never exercised the privilege of executive session in all the time I was there. Well, that was great, and I think you probably had less difficulty with your students over the years because of that than any of the other departments or schools. Well, we had a lot of difficulty, of course, with the GI students. Uh, uh, primarily in, in their uh, attitude towards education, the, in the demands, of what they wanted. They wanted widely different things, which no institution with any sort of a uh, organized curriculum could satisfy. But I think we did pretty well. Of course, there's another thing we haven't touched on, is that uh, the tremendous amount of writing that you did in the field and your book, of course, the came to be known as the Bible in the Field, Principles and Practices of Photography. Uh, now that's gone through what, uh, 
Seven editions now? Well, as principles and pra uh, photography principles and practices, it went through, I think, four editions. Then we changed the uh, title to uh, Photography of Materials and Processes. And uh, there are six editions. And we, there is a seventh over there now. That's except, great. except for five missing chapters. <laughs> Well, that's marvelous, and certainly that had its impact. Well, that was uh, uh, that was translated into both uh, Russian. They've all been translated into Russian, and the uh, six was translated into Spanish, and uh, that's why I had that letter there. The who, the Spanish who's who, uh, wanted me to fill out a form for inclusion in Spanish who's who. <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, I've heard some of the students say it might as well have been in Greek as far as they understood, but that may be just a... <laughs> I, did, I did have a book published in Greek once. No fooling. It was a little book uh, I wrote at Kodak, and uh, uh, Kodak uh, Egypt uh, decided to reprint it, and they reprinted it in Greek. Printed in Greek. Well, that's great. Now, some of your other faculty were also very productive when it came to not only exhibiting, but also to, to uh, writing. Hollis Todd. Well, Hollis uh, did quite a bit of uh, writing and still is. And Dick Zakey has worked with him on a number of things. And uh, Rick was just published uh, with Todd, a book on statistics, uh, and some other papers. It's the only book that I can remember. Uh, didn't Les, uh, Les Strobos Strobos has, publish, uh, uh, published one book with uh, partly with me and he published a book on his own on view camera technique. Yeah, I guess that's what I was thinking. <clears throat> well now, when you became first division chairman and then later dean of the uh, College of Graphic Arts and Photography, the School of Printing came under your wing and Byron Culver was at that time uh, director of the School of Printing. Uh, we haven't said anything about that, and of course Byron is now deceased, mm -hmm. and there aren't many people that know too much about the early history of the School of Printing. Uh, well, most of it, the major outlines, or as a matter of record, of course. Would be in the catalogs, yes. Yeah. I don't think I need to go over with you, the Empire State School of Printing and that sort of thing, and all that is done, how it was uh, moved up to the Institute uh, 36, 37, 37, I, believe, 37 I think, year after I came. Yes. And that, in some ways, uh, paralleled the growth of the School of Photography from the standpoint of numbers and the standpoint of uh, reputation. It became a uh, the uh, enrollment was larger at one time than photography. I think photography is, is quite a bit larger now. now. Yes, that's right. Uh, but again, I think under your leadership there, uh, the entire college. The, the difference in enrollment, by the way, I think was a direct result of active participation by the uh, printing field, the printing industry, uh, to a different way than in Fidarity. Most of the students in Fidarity came because they wanted to learn Fidarity. A great many of the students uh, became printing were back supported by the printing industry, I mean, individual uh, printing concerns. Parents or relatives. Right. In the, yes. Right. Yes, I think that's right. That uh, is a significant difference there. Well, CB, I have a personal question or two. Uh, I uh, wonder how you happen to get in photography yourself. I do remember hearing that you've been at uh, Texas A&M at one time, but how did you get started in photography? Well, uh, this is odd. I began working for uh, one Christmas vacation for the American Express Company. Just for the Christmas vacation, I was still in high school. And uh, I took the money I made from that, two dollars for the week, <laughs> and bought a two dollar box brownie. 
And uh, oddly enough, instead of taking the uh, roll of film to be developed and printed to a corner drugstore as we would today, I took it to a professional photographer. And so when he uh, developed it, he made the prints for me and all, told me what I had done wrong and so on. Uh, he gave me another roll. And uh, things developed from that. I began uh, working for him after school and on Saturdays, and uh, one thing grew to another, and so I got him with the old Well, that's interesting. Was this down in Virginia? Is that where you grew up? Uh, well, actually, yes. This uh, this first part of it was down in Roanoke, and I left I left Roanoke. Uh, in high school for Philadelphia. But this actually began down Ronald. And so I worked with the studio there after school on uh, Saturdays for about a year or so. Then we moved to Philadelphia. And uh, by that time I had the bus. Well, then you went to Penn State, did you not? Too? I went to Illinois. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah, I went to a little college in uh, Effingham, Illinois College. I went there for a year, and then I went to Penn State. And then after that, you were on the faculty at, uh, at Texas A&M, were you? Yeah, yeah. Well, I was really uh, not so much on the faculty. I never had a faculty appointment. Although I did uh, do some teaching. I went there to the idea I was going to teach uh, as a side issue, and it became very much of a side issue. Uh, they, had a, uh, they had a photographic science laboratory in uh, research administration. Uh, they had and still have a good deal of their research activities in agriculture, in geology, and uh, petroleum research and so on, soil research and so on, all grouped in the, uh, one place. Uh, research Administration Division, in their own building and everything. And uh, so I went there to take over that laboratory and to um, initiate a course in photography. Well, the course in photography ran about a year, and nobody was interested in it, particularly nobody would spend any money to give us any facilities and so on, and so that went by the wayside. And so for the last four years I was there, all I was doing was uh, the photographic work in connection with uh, state research. And so uh, we did every, I did everything under the sun in terms of photography. Uh, for agricultural research, for chemical research went on, for genetics, uh, for pathology, for uh, geological survey, uh, because they're running uh, geological surveys on all of the uh, state-owned land, and that was and is considerable, <coughs> because the state kept the mineral rights, you know, the subsoil rights to all the land they sold. And, uh, the uh, soil surveys were going on a great deal of Texas at that time had not even had a reconnaissance survey of soils. Not a detailed survey, one one test per mile, square mile had not been done. Well, now, the, the, first, the first reconnaissance soil uh, survey of the uh, Big Bend National Park, that area, was done while I was there. Is that right? That's a lot of territory to yeah. <laughs> fly over and to survey. Uh, then you went from Texas to, uh, to Kodak? Didn't you? I went from Texas to Kodak in 1930. I see. Great. Background. No, I, I, have, uh, I have the article. Incidentally, I have, a, have the article that I published along about 28 or 29, which was a reason I didn't know at the time and he, uh, that uh, Billings hired me to come to the company to teach at, at uh, Mechanics Institute. Oh, for heaven's sake. He never told me I was going to do any teaching when he hired me. 
That's interesting. No, I went there expecting an entirely different job, and I've been working about a month in Billings, uh, asking to come down to the office, and he uh, told me about what's going on over the institute. He said, we'd like you to teach the second year over there, and then he took me over to meet Colonel Randall. That's the way it all started, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Very good. I had, I had sworn that I was going to leave education for good. I spent 10 years in trying to get the colleges to put even put in even one decent course in photography and hadn't gotten anywhere so I said well I'm getting 30 years old now and I might as well quit. Well certainly the growth of the school and the College of Graphic Arts and Photography at the Institute is a great tribute to you CB and uh, the work that you did with the faculty and the students and all the rest of us around there. I was very much interested a month or so ago. I don't know whether they're going to use it or not. And who's who asked me for uh, a detailed biography. They're going to supplement who's who uh, coming uh, issue with a number of selected extended biographies. Great. And uh, they didn't say how many they wrote to. I yeah. suppose several hundred or thousand or two. And so whether they use mine, I have no idea. Oh, that's marvelous. Well, I think we've probably about exhausted the tape here and also ourselves for the moment, so we'll just shut this off. <coughs>